Hello and welcome to Fire Headlines, where we cover the hottest topics in fire service news. I'm your host, Samantha Didion. Joining me on the panel today is Chief Trisha Wolford, the Fire Chief for Anne County Fire Department and the Vice President for the International Fire Chiefs Association. Our topic today is leading an organization of inclusion. Thank you, Chief Wolford, for joining me today. I'd love to start off by hearing about your background. What inspired you to pursue a career in the fire service and what has this journey looked like for you? Well, thank you so much. I appreciate being here. Um, The journey has been fantastic. I've been the fire chief here in Anne Arundel County for five years. Um, It is the coolest job. It's the coolest position I have had in the fire service, um, which doesn't make it easy, but it does make it fun if you allow it to be fun. Um, And, you know, I joined as a new young firefighter, not knowing very much about the fire service and certainly never saying I'm going to be fire chief. Um, Not until really I got in a couple more years. Um, I think my story is similar uh, to a lot of others in the fire service. I came from a public safety family. Um, My dad's side was law enforcement. My mom's side was fire. Um, I have an uncle and a cousin who are in the Rockford Fire Department in Illinois, which is where I was born and raised. And I would hang out there, probably not on the regular basis, like most people would say, their volunteer house hanging out. Um, But I knew my mom would take me to the station and I would see my cousins and my uncle and they would stand out on the engine, you know, with their foot up on the the side, drinking their coffee in the morning. And my cousin would let me put on his huge turnout gear when I was a little girl and um, and they always had good food. So what things wouldn't any child love, you know, cool clothes and, you know, noisy fire engines and really good food that I could eat any time. Um, and there was no women in the station, right? There were no women that were predominantly around. We had no women firefighters or police officers in the family, but nobody ever said you couldn't. Nobody ever said no. Nobody ever said that's not for you. Um, and so, you know, all that kind of gets just dumped away and you go about life. Um, My background is in art, uh, marketing and graphic design and fine arts. And that's what I went to school for, which that is really not the criteria to be a fire chief. Um, But I'm also an athlete. I was a college athlete. I'm a very hands-on physical person. And I remember thinking, I can do the office thing, but I really like this whole firefighter thing. Like, I really want to give that a try. Um, And that's what I did after college is I just started applying. And I remember telling my mom and she thought, "Um, okay, let's just see how this goes. But she also knew, right? My cousins, my uncle, they did it, that kind of thing. And that was really it. I, um, I got hired in 2006 by Anne Arundel County. Um, I did 10 years here. I'm just kind of giving you the brief rundown. Uh, I left for a couple of years because I needed more skills. And that was the time frame that I realized I need more training, more skills, more administrative work, because I really want to come back to this department that I love and be the fire chief. Um, And so I I started working on it. I ended up in Bozeman, Montana for two years uh, working for Josh Waldo, the fire chief there. Uh, as a deputy chief and the city fire marshal. And then I moved for a year over to Spokane, Washington and worked for Brian Schaefer, who is the recently retired fire chief. Uh, so there is a uh, Western in my blood. Uh, this is part of why um, I love working with Western fire chiefs. Um, as I spent three years out there, they were magical, educational, difficult, challenging. Um, And then I got lucky with the political cycle here back in Maryland um, and the county executive that came in and started his first term, brought me in as one of his first directors. Uh, And I was lucky enough to come back home three years later. And it's been a bit of a Cinderella story that has been really cool to be a part of. Yeah, that is an amazing story. And so during all of that time, were there any other female firefighters working alongside you? When I was here in Anne Arundel, there were. um, I came in in a recruit class of maybe 50 or 60, and there were seven or eight of us, um, which I now realize is unique. At the time, I just thought this 
this is a tight little locker room, right? There's a lot of hair and girls and chatter. And, you know, as we're going through recruit school, I didn't realize that that was unique to actually have that many. Um, but Ann Rendell's always been very good um, and worked very hard to be progressive in terms of a diverse workforce. When I went to Bozeman, uh, Bozeman is an organization of uh, 133 years of a fire service. And I was the first female that came in. Josh was very progressive. Um, and knew he wanted to start doing that. I think they maybe viewed that a little differently because I wasn't kind of boots on the ground firefighter, but the 50 men that worked in that department were fantastic. Um, and there were not a lot of challenges and they were very respectful. Um, there were some outside challenges that, that came with that. And it was a really great learning opportunity. Some of the things that I never thought as an executive that I would be dealing with as a, a woman in the workforce were presented to me. And Josh was a really great leader that stood up for me and really worked for the equality of just being an employee in a system that maybe didn't understand or didn't want to understand or hadn't experienced it. Um, you know, no blame. It's just, you know, learning. And it's different when you're a female in some of these roles. And so then coming back here to Anne Arundel, I mean, Spokane had women in the workforce. I was the first female in their leadership group um, at that high level. It was a number two position, which is their assistant chief. Again, very progressive with Brian being the fire chief there. Uh, certainly some challenges. But, you know, a lot of the things that I talk about is I, you really have to weigh as a female in the industry. Is it everyone's challenge? Is it just your challenge because you're a woman? Is it your challenge because you're maybe not where you need to be as a person in that role? There's a, a lot of self-awareness and self-evaluation as to what is the core issue. Um, and having a good level of self-reflection sometimes means it's not just a female issue, um, but it is an issue that needs to be correct, corrected for maybe any group that's underrepresented. Right. So as far as some of like the fitness things that had to go through, were there different metrics that you had to meet versus your male coworkers or was it all the same across the board? No, absolutely not. Same standards. I, I would say the fire service um, has been good about standardizing, um, whether it's physically or academically or always lots of conversations about lowering a standard. Um, you know, the the phrase of, uh, you know, lowering a standard for minorities makes my skin crawl. Um, we, we don't have the luxury of lowering anything when you're in this type of profession. Um, and I don't agree with the minority term because minor means less, right? So I use the term underrepresented um, because to me that that's what we're saying. There's just not enough of us to be a larger representation. Um, so I would say no, but I would say the fire service has also been good and needs to be better um, about how we get people from where they are to where they need to be. Um, and I say people neutrally because in that case, it doesn't matter, right? You, you can see a non-physically fit white male or black female or Asian female, um, sometimes they're just not fit and they're not there. But I don't like the conversation that because you can't pass this physical agility test, you can't be a part of this organization. There's so much more to our EMS clinicians and our firefighters than just passing an IPAT, a CPAT, a Cooper's test. Um, and we need to be more open-minded. That would give us a greater level of diversity. And do you think over your years in the fire service that that diversity like has expanded and that they are, the culture has evolved to be more inclusive in that way? I think there is a great deal of the fire service that is addressing it and learning it. Um, I think there's a great deal of leaders rising into these roles. Um, that have experienced that in some way. So they're very passionate and compelled to continue to make change. We're doing better. We're doing okay in some areas. We're doing good in some areas. I think what I tend to lean on is it's not a fad, right? We're not a trend. Um, there is fatigue with diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging. Um, it has to get to a point that we don't have to have key term words. That is just who we are as a business. 
Um, but we also know very clearly if you're not fixing your culture, if you have a level of tolerance for any type of discrimination or lack of action, right? Not saying anything is also its own form of discrimination. Um, if there is a tolerance for that, that can't be supported by your city or your district or your county, you're never going to make change because all we do is bring in this great level of diversity from our recruitment teams. And then we see in two to five years, they're gone because what's the point, right? I don't like being here. People aren't nice to me. I don't feel like I have any value. Um, I want to be around other folks that look like myself. I mean, I was really lucky that I had females around me through my career. That doesn't mean that I didn't get assigned to stations that didn't have any females. That was very common. Or I didn't work in a specialized unit that didn't have other females. But there were other females I could talk to. Um, coming in as a fire chief here, I'm, I try to be very thoughtful of what that feel like, feels like to not belong or not feel like you can find somebody that associates with you. Um, this is one of the great things about us having um, I women and the Women's Chief Council. Um, there's other women fire chiefs that I can talk to to say, what are you guys doing? You know, how are you finding a shirt that fits you? Um, what's your nail polish policy? Um, you know, the big conversations are really important. Um, all the chiefs working on lactation policies and maternity policies and, and things like that. And that's a great one for me because as a woman, everybody thinks I understand, but I'm not a mother. I haven't had a child. So I need to be educated just like any other male would need to be educated. And it's a, a really great balance for me to go, okay, I shouldn't just assume just because you're a black female that you understand what would be perceived as a black female issue. Might not be, right? The, the color doesn't drive the issue. The gender doesn't drive the issue. Um, there's just a lot of awareness that we need to have and probably a great deal of patience to listen. I need to listen to a lot of what my members say. You know, if you have trans or LGBTQ or, you know, you, you got to listen to what folks need, um, no matter if you consider them underrepresented or not. Absolutely. And those two groups that you just mentioned, can you expand on them a little bit more for any of our listeners who might not be familiar with them? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, yes, yeah. so there's uh, Women in Fire, and then there's the Women's Chief Council. Women's Chief Council is part of IAFC, um, and it's for four and five bugle uh, chiefs. So, again, it's just a place for us to network and talk. And, you know, the funny thing about it is everybody thinks we get on our Zoom calls and, right, we're talking about all these women issues. This is a bunch of fire chiefs. We're talking about staffing, budget, politics, right? We're talking about all the same things that our male counterparts are talking about. Um, but it is a great network to have. Uh, women in Fire um, is a fantastic organization and, and they focus on uh, women in the fire and EMS service, uh, how to mentor them, how to bring them up through the ranks, uh, you know, promotion, things like that. Um, and they're a very strong organization uh, that has good awareness of how to represent those that don't feel represented, but at the same time, uh, the executive board leading that, these are operational women, you know, running divisions, running fire grounds, uh, running paramedic programs. So they understand the balance of you still have a job to do, um, but how do we bring more to the table? So one, our voices are heard and two, there are more diverse thought processes, no, no matter white male, white female, whatever it is, everybody counts. Absolutely. And with some of the LGBTQ plus community to the fire service, what advice do you have for fire service leaders to ensure that they are feeling a part of the fire service community? Because I feel like that is a topic that isn't talked about as much. It's not. And what I uh, what I try to explain to folks is um, they're here, right? They're here. They are in your stations. They have been working here. They've been, been applying here for years. Um, unfortunately, they're too scared or too concerned or too worried. I don't want to. I don't want to put words in somebody else's mouth. They don't want to come forward for a reason. Our job is to allow them to come forward and be who they want to be. the The greatest leaders are the people that are the most comfortable with themselves, 
And when you are in a situation to make command decisions that involve the life of a firefighter or the life of a community member, whether it's on a trauma arrest or it's on a structure fire, you cannot be the best version of yourself unless you are allowed to be yourself. And our job as the fire service is to say, I know you're here, come forward because we're going to take care of you. And I want to know, I want to understand. Um, I want to be supportive of your family. You know, I want you, if you're a female, to be able to bring your wife with you to promotional ceremonies and not worry about if people are going to be rude or disrespectful um, or ostracize you at the station. Um, so I continue to tell folks, you know, when people say, I don't have anybody gay in my department, I was like, well, that's cute. I bet you do. <laughs> right. And they've just never said a word to you about it. Um, and so I lean more on the culture part of that, making a culture that wants and needs for people to want to tell their story and to be proud of who they are. I tell my new officers this all the time. Your job is to find something about your crew members that they find really important and that they are convicted to. And whatever that pride and that conviction is, your job as an officer is to take those pieces and make it the strongest part of your crew. I guarantee those folks will work day and night for that officer if they feel personal and professional value. We do good professionally, uh, but this day and age, a, a firehouse doesn't exist without a personal side. We don't just deal with work problems. We deal with home problems and life problems. Um, and people have to be afforded the opportunity to be who they are 100%, not 50% because they can't bring the other half to work. And kind of not really changing subjects, but I'm curious, what has your experience been with being a female in the fire service interacting with the community. Just what is what is that like? Like little girls coming up to you seeing a female firefighter. Um, yeah, I have a huge smile on my face because because um, it's incredible. Um, and we know that young kids, especially young women, um, we, you know, we know when they're about that Girl Scout brownie age, anywhere from like eight to 10, that visualization and seeing other women in the fire service, you know, hop out of the back seat of an engine uh, with their turnout pants on, um, or, you know, seeing a chief officer in their uniform, uh, they're in awe. They're normally in disbelief, like, hmm, right? They're all kind of sizing you up, like they're fact checking you a little bit, which I love, right? Like, I'm like, yep, go for it. Um, and if you're really, if you're not in turnout gear, because that's really what they, you can see, um, that's when they're like, hmm, you know, I'm going to see, because everybody always thinks we're police officers in our uniforms. <laughs> uh, so really it's, it's magical. Um, it's magical to think that every year in September, what you do as a profession is hanging on a shelf for a little kid to come pick up as a costume to wear in October. I mean, that's right. It's amazing. Um, we have to foster that and let them know that they can um, and that it's a great career and it's a great retirement um, and that they'll do really well. The other side of that is quite interesting also, because as a female chief, um, a lot of adults don't believe you, <laughs> which is funny sometimes. <laughs> um, if you, you know, if you're not in your uniform or, or if you are and your name tags covered up and, um, you know, and I introduce myself and I say the fire chief and, and they almost like just glitch in front of you. And they're like, I'm sorry, what? And I'm like, the fire chief, you know, like, were you asking for the fire chief or I'm at a community event, I'm introducing yourself, um, especially if you're new, obviously my community, they're pretty well versed at this point. Um, and they're like, no, 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 I'm looking for the fire chief. And I'm like, yeah, right. Yes, I'm, I'm right here. And they're just kind of like, oh, and some of them to even forget. And it just comes out of mouth. They go, oh, you're a woman. Yes. Most days I try to be ladylike, <laughs> but you know, it's one of those things. Um, I've been multiple times confused um, for my assistant. Um, like, no, we'd, we'd like to speak to the fire chief. And I'm like, yes, that's me. And they're like, no, not the chief's assistant. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> so. how, how does that impact you personally? I mean, I'm sure you've been doing it for years, but maybe in the early stages of your, uh, your early stages as, as a fire chief. Yeah, it's good. Um, Self-control. 
uh, emotional discipline. Uh, to me, I see it as growth because your first instinct in the beginning, my first instinct was irritation, not anger, um, irritation. Um, if it happened multiple times, then it's anger. Um, and then I thought, okay, like, how cool is that, that they have never seen something like this, that their brain doesn't even fathom to pick that up, that you have to say it multiple times. Um, and I think what a great opportunity, again, going back to like seeing young girls, like what a great opportunity to um, not highlight it because nobody, you know, that's like an awkward little area too. Um, but to educate and to talk about, you know, in Maryland, when I came in, we had, I was one of the first of four female fire chiefs. One of them has retired all four of them running metro departments. Um, three of us are, are still doing it. Like I said, the one retired. We couldn't find another state that had four female metro chiefs. Um, and I thought, way to go, Maryland, right? Like that was a great talking point when people were like, oh, uh, and I'm like, don't feel bad, right? It's Anne Arundel County's never had a female chief. Like it's not normal. So I don't expect you to know, um, but you got to take it as growth because you're going to get hit with all of these weird situations and you certainly get hit with some very interesting questions. Um, and, you know, for anybody that would be listening that knows me, um, I I tend not to get angry, but I tend to get a little sassy here and there. So you kind of got to pull back on that, too. Like, would, would you ask a male fire chief that question? Because my guess is probably not. Um, why would you ask me that question? Um, so you got to know your audience and uh, have a very professional conversation while making sure your point is heard. Exactly. And I love your mindset for that. An opportunity to educate. That is very beautifully said. What advice would you give to another woman or women who aspire to have leadership roles in the fire service or even similar fields? Yeah, I think similar um, male dominant fields, specifically with the fire service, you know, if they're looking to come in or if you're looking to promote, um, you know, you're you're looking to find the right fit. Um, and whether that's as an entry level, if it's um, uh, you're applying, most firefighters apply to multiple departments, as did I, because uh, if you know you want this job and you know you have a passion for this type of service work, you're going to apply everywhere. A lot of people in multiple states, too. Um, but I think for the the women that are applying, um, there is no such thing to me as too old. Um, I have recruits in the academy, 51, 56. Um, I've also got 18 and 19 year olds. Um, if there is a passion to do this work, I would say listen to it and at least give it a shot. Um, but I would say with the fit comment, look for departments that are specifically supporting women. And when I say that, um, gender neutral policies, um, maternity policies, um, leave policies. Um, my question to women is, are you interested in this job now or are you interested in this job for a career? And if you are, do you also want to have the opportunity to build a family and whatever your version of family is, um, to have a significant other, to raise kids, to adopt kids, to foster care, to have four dogs, you know, whatever it is, make sure that you're with a department that is considering that as part of the hire. When I hire people, I assume I'm hiring family. Um, my job is to take care of the member through their career, to send them home at their retirement, but to try to keep them healthy enough that they feel successful in their personal life. The better version they are with their family, the better version I get for my community. Um, so my advice would be, and same thing with promotion, are you gonna be in a spot that your chief understands you're a new promoted division chief, but you're a single parent and two days a week, you have to get your son to soccer practice at 3.30. Are they going to adjust your schedule? Um, if you're having the right conversation and you're working with the right leadership group, they they will, and they should find a way. Um, they should find a way to do that fairly so nobody else feels that they're getting less because they don't have a child, right? That's the same conversation. Well, I don't have kids. Do I get to leave at 3.30? You know, you have to have fair, open conversations, um, but you have to make sure that you're you're with a department that is um, understanding different doesn't mean better or worse. It just means different. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up? 
Yeah, I think the only thing I'd want to add is um, I love this conversation. I, I love talking about growing and improving a workforce, especially when that workforce has the greatest contact with your community. And and that's what we do. Um, and that's why we talk about trust, because those folks are the ones that earn the trust. Um, so I absolutely love having uh, the belonging, the inclusion, the diversity conversation. What I always worry about is majority of our workforce is white male. And having this conversation about diversity, for me, does not negate the good work of what white men are doing in our industry. Some of my greatest mentors uh, are men. Actually, majority of them are men. Um, so I think it's important that having this conversation is forward, is moving ahead, is loud, but it shouldn't be taken in a sense of that discredits the other members in your department, because I rely on all of them. Um, and some of the men in my world have been my greatest champions, my greatest motivators, um, and they have done some of the harder work in the background to pave that road. Um, I talk about women and how they lead from the run in front and we have to continue to pave the road moving forward. There are a lot of men who are flattening the earth in front of us. So we have a nice, smooth pavement moving forward. Um, so I think that's important that we make sure the conversation stays equal. Um, but there's nothing in my soul that wouldn't love to see more women in the fire service um, who are happily and successfully moving through the fire and EMS service. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's been a great time. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you have a question for the panel, please reach out to us at fireheadlines at wfca.com and let us know what's on your mind. We'll see you back here next week for more Fire Headlines.